there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Any epoch will exhibit a dominant aesthetic or stylistic culture. And design history as a discipline uses style and the form of things as a way of investigating culture. The idea that a thing is, expresses something more than itself. From the post-war modern style to the diversity of the new millennium, explore six decades of Canadian design. The reason why design is important in Canada is because it is what defines us as a culture. It also defines us in our everyday world. Delve into the collection of the Design Exchange, Canada's National Design Museum, to uncover the exceptional stories behind the objects of everyday life. These are the symbols of our cultural past and present. The 1990s were bursting with hope and possibility. Computers were suddenly everywhere, and cell phone usage exploded. The World Wide Web was made available to the public in 1992, and the world as we knew it was dramatically altered. This was a revolutionary decade in terms of digital technology. The phenomenon of globalism truly emerged at this time. Information was transferred more easily and the local boundaries of culture became increasingly blurred. This controversial reality was reflected in the style of the times. A clean, polished, more universal look was embraced by designers and consumers alike. In Canada, there was a resurgence of design during this decade. In the early 90s, Canada found itself in a recession that affected much of the Western world. But as the decade progressed, North America experienced economic expansion. The introduction of the North American Free Trade Agreement meant that Canadian industry had to learn to compete. And in the world of furniture, this meant a stronger focus on design itself. Large design firms were investing in product research and development, and many sophisticated and exciting products surfaced. Design by Decade revisits the 1990s to examine some of the most distinctive and cutting-edge Canadian designs that represent this revolutionary era. Certainly one uh, can chronologically trace uh, the beginning of this computer-saturated society to the 1990s. If you think about the character of the 1980s, which was about excess and a type of rampant embrace of money, the 1990s had in many ways culturally similar tones, but there was also embedded in that decade a type of reversal, a shift in sensibility on things about the election of Bill Clinton in 1992, sort of heralded as a new age. You think about rising environmental concerns, you think about a return architecturally uh, to a type of neo-modernism. If the 1980s were all about me, the 1990s perhaps were more or increasingly about us. There is a sensibility that emerges in this decade that I can only describe as clean and precise. We can see the 1990s as an aesthetic that is highly technological, mechanical, but fine mechanical. One of the most significant Canadian designers is Douglas Ball. Throughout his illustrious career, he's created a range of designs, many of which focus on workspace systems. In 1993, Douglas Ball designed the inventive Clipper CS1. This personal workstation allows the user to be enclosed in their work environment with all necessities within arm's reach. 
The clipper is a capsule design that uses curvaceous forms. New Space, out of Fort Worth, Texas, produced limited numbers of the clipper over the course of the decade. This design is now part of the permanent collection at the London Museum of Design. The clipper is a fantastical workstation. I guess it's possible that somebody hasn't heard of the clipper. It wasn't around for very long. It was produced over a period of three years. It was designed as my personal way to work. He obviously built it for himself and how he would like to work. It is for a computer because you need to block out the light and that's why he's creating this womb for which you can work in. To me, the clipper is a transportation device. I took a road trip and the road trip acted like a switch. I woke up one night thinking about this trip and I, I, I realized that I'd driven for four to five hours in comfort. I had no neck pain, no eye strain. I felt really quite good. I had never made the connection between driving in an automobile for a long distance to that of working in the office. And by morning, this whole concept was quite well thought out. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. We built a prototype, and I sat in that and worked, and did a lot of computer work for the next four years. That was the precursor to the clipper. Eye strain was taken care of by the fact that I was putting the screen where the road would be, and I was controlling the amount of glare. So I was able to balance the background light with the screen. You flick little switches overhead, and the air comes on, and the lights come on. It's like starting up an aircraft. It's an entirely different experience. The clipper is a combination of wood and plastic. It looks like a type of cocoon made out of blonde wood. It seems to have gills like a fish, and it has doors that open. It sort of represents a type of aesthetic cross between an Airstream trailer and a type of Scandinavian modernist chair. It is possible to lift the flaps, the erstwhile windows of the clipper, so as to let natural light in and so that one can look at the person inside and so that the person inside can look out. As a result, it's an adaptable work environment, but primarily it's a place where work can be done in isolation, but not alone. The Clipper CS1 exemplifies Douglas Ball's advanced critical approach to workspace design. Ball continues his practice with similar concerns regarding privacy and comfort, with his recent projects for major office furniture manufacturer, Herman Miller. The 1990s were very much part of the information age. The popularity of computers was evident in most facets of life, in particular, design. Technological advances coupled with liberalized trade led to new consumer attitudes. Many products adopted a digital look. A variety of factors contributed to the appeal of this aesthetic style. Computer-aided design gave users increased flexibility and the capacity to more easily achieve curved forms. The increased use of plastics was also very influential in the style that defined this period. The results of these advances were often more simple and minimalist than earlier designs and were embraced as an alternative to the more ornamental style of 1980s postmodernism. The new sophisticated 3D modeling programs gave designers a whole new interface to work with. And primarily, I think, what defines a digitally aged product is curves. One of the most important trends or movements that came out of the 90s was globalism. With technology, we were now able to communicate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Markets were more open. People were very active across the world. And this trend of globalism began to reflect in the furniture that we have, in that it didn't have a particular regionalism or a particular aesthetic that was tied to a place. It had a global aesthetic, so it could be of any time and any place around the world. Designer Karim Rashid's signature style wonderfully embodies a number of design trends of the 1990s. Rashid was born in Egypt and currently practices in New York, but he was raised in Canada, where he also began his career. 
Often describing himself as a global citizen, Karim Rashid has become one of the most famous designers in the world, delving into industrial design, interior design and fashion. He has a global approach to design, creating objects with broad appeal. Rashid's designs involve fluid, blob-like forms. He pushes the boundaries of materials and embraces computer technology, which plays a key role in his design process. A lot of my work is a bit organic or a bit biomorphic in form. And at the same time, those forms are really coming more from the technology than they are trying to be derivative of nature. In the range of, of the work I've done, let's say, in the past 25 years, I think that there's a common thread in it all. And the common thread really is to elevate or create some sense of human pleasure. Karim Rashid rose to prominence in the 90s, mostly due to his celebrated work with the flourishing Canadian design firm Umbra. Formed in 1979 by childhood friends Paul Rowan and Les Mandelbaum, Umbra became one of the most successful North American houseware design and manufacturing companies. Creating a wide range of products, Umbra is based out of Toronto, but has a warehouse in Buffalo and manufacturing sites in both Canada and China. Umbra is known for its playful and affordable products. It was certainly the heyday for Umbra. We grew the most during the 90s. I think Umbra's rise to design prominence uh, was in keeping with a change in aesthetics in North America and in the West. There was a return to a type of modernist sensibility. And I think Umbra's objects, some of them are biomorphic, some of them are sort of minimal, some of them are functional and rational. That sort of acknowledges that taste and style in the 1990s rejected postmodernism in very sort of serious and uh, legitimate ways. I think one of the contributions that, that Umbra has done is the legitimizing of plastics as a design material. The most ubiquitous design that Karim Rashid developed for Umbra is the Garbo waste bin. The all-plastic garbage can was introduced in 1996 and was available in a variety of colors including translucent plastic a groundbreaking development at the time. The Garbo can is a shining example of democratic design, bringing high design into the homes of everyday people at affordable prices. This is a trash can that has a very sculptural shape. I'm sure you've seen it, we've sold millions. It comes in various sizes and colors and finishes of plastic. Kind of a sexy shape and an open top. What's so fantastic about the Garbo can? Well, it's, it's just a plastic garbage can, you know, you think, whoopee. But it's not a plastic garbage can, it's so much more. It has these wonderful, curvaceous forms. The plastic is so thin and, and transparent, it looks like blown glass. When Karen first approached us, he had a, a very unique style that was emerging. And we also were incorporating at the time some very interesting new polypropylene uh, translucent plastics which really, uh, I think, transformed that whole product into something very, very special. The idea of translucence in home accessories was quite revolutionary. I don't say that we invent translucence plastics. It was used in science, but certainly for everyday objects, the Garbo can changed everything. One of the dominant looks of the 90s was the transparent look. Partly it was advances in polycarbonate, which was happening in the auto industry. Everything was either transparent with color or clear transparent. That's what we coveted, that's what we wanted. Everything was driven, you could argue, by either function or some sort of sense of performance or use. And at the end of the day, people just like the form. That's what attracts them to it at the first place. But this is the interesting part about Garbo, and I think part of the success of Garbo, and I wish I could repeat this with other products, and I think about this a lot, is that over time, you enjoy using the object, and you learn and realize how functional it really is. And I decided to cut a scoop in it, and I cut the scoop in it, which ended up that you don't even recognize that it's actually a circle. And why did I cut the scoop in it? It was to actually cut two holes in it for the handles, because then you could only stack the garbage to the lower part of the circle. 
and the garbage would actually never touch your hand. And then at the bottom, I made a rounded bottom. And I think this is where design really, really is, is important because these are such simple, pragmatic things. Is I realized that you know, coffee and everything would always end in a corner of a waste can at the bottom. So I thought if I rounded out the bottom, then it just cleans really easy. It's a beautiful design and it's incredibly inexpensive. So it's that idea of also democratizing design, design for everyone. And the Garbino, which is the smaller version of the Garbo, is in the MoMA's design collection. After the tremendous success of the Garbo can, Umbra decided to enter into the world of furniture. Produced in 1999, the O chair offers a high level of comfort for a plastic chair. Like the Garbo can, for most Canadians, it is immediately recognizable. This was a much more serious endeavor for them because they had to work on molds and they had to invest in R&D. And the O-Chair, I think, it exemplifies this digital look. It was a very successful chair for Umbra and it added more cachet to the manufacturer. If we want to change the world and make the world a better place, we have to make democratic things because in the reality is design is not about a, a chair that you see in a museum. Design is about the chair that's in everybody's home. Using innovative design approaches, significant investment and computer-aided design, Karim Rashid and Umbra have introduced a number of iconic award-winning designs to the international market. Globalization and technological advances encouraged a renewed focus on design in Canada in the 1990s. This era was deeply affected by computers and the digital revolution, yielding many designs that adopted a technological look, distinct from earlier eras. This period saw an increase in the use of plastics, as well as a willingness by manufacturers to invest in new methods and products. It's a global marketplace now, and you need to have your product stand out. Price point is only one factor when a consumer chooses a product. Design is another important factor. What I think Free Trade did is it really inspired and forced Canadian manufacturers to use design and to use it more effectively for their products. A lot of manufacturers like me and Camper and Kielhauer and Technion, all office furniture manufacturers, really turn to local Canadian designers to help them become more competitive. One such designer is Tom Deacon. After founding his own design and manufacture company in the 1980s, Deacon began to work as a freelance designer. Starting with the Deacon chair in 1989, Tom Deacon has formed a fruitful relationship with family-owned Canadian company Kielhauer creating cutting-edge products for the international market. Dickett's career has been distinguished by a consistently high output of a very specific type of object. He became known as a person who would make office chairs and work chairs, but he brought to that a type of luxurious sensibility and a type of comfort. The Tom Chair is a stellar example of sophisticated Canadian design emerging in the 1990s. It falls under the umbrella of task seating. These are adjustable chairs traditionally meant for office use and contain a swivel base. Named after the designer, the Tom Chair is highly adjustable in an effort to provide maximum comfort for the user. Made predominantly of plastic, the research and development for this advanced product was extensive but Kielhauer's significant investment was undoubtedly worthwhile. The Tom chair is really a whole lot of chairs. It's really a family of components. It's an ergonomic office chair, task chair, there's an executive version of it. So there are three or four different arm options, there are three back heights, there are different upholstery options, two seat depths. All of those can be combined in various ways to make a broad range. It's, it's a lot of products in one. What's important about the Tom chair is it's quite a sophisticated task chair. It's driven by levers and it goes up and down and so forth. 
It wasn't the first levered chair, but it was for a Canadian. So Kielar, they're not only keeping up with the trends, but they're advancing them and pushing them further. When I was developing the Tom Chair for Kielhauer, the way we achieved the level of comfort it has was primarily trial and error and lots of experimentation. By the time it got to market, it involved about a $2 million investment, which for Kielhauer at the time was, was a, you know, a bit of a, a leap, an act of faith. In the 90s, manufacturers like Kielhauer and Niencamper were really tooling up. They had to stay competitive, and plastic is a serious investment. Tom Chair was the first time I had ever worked in plastic, and it was the first time Kielhauer had worked in large-scale molded plastic, so it was a real learning curve for both of us. The base is plastic, the seat back is plastic, the arms are plastic. The arms are not solid plastic, which would make it very heavy and expensive to ship and expensive to manufacture. They wanted the, everything to be lightweight, and that, that's very complicated to do. Using plastics in this day and age necessitates using computers because the machines that make the molds are con controlled by computers. The good part about plastic is that once you make that investment in the molds, then the actual part cost is, is much lower. So it means that the product can be much less expensive. But you have to have confidence that you're going to sell a lot of them for it to make sense. Tom Deacon's chair to me looks like a romantic successionist chair from the turn of the century. It's black and it's got those beautiful punctured holes in it and I see Joseph Hoffman in that particular design. And then the way he hides the mechanism to raise the chair up and down, he kind of hides it in plastic and it creates a, almost a bustle behind the chair. So I think the chair has quite a nice turn of the century look. The Tom chair by Deacon it doesn't look simple, but it doesn't necessarily look as complicated as it is as a product of design process. And this chair works brilliantly as a desk chair. One can sit in it for long stretches of time at a table that's well lit and accomplish great things. And that's what Mr. Deacon intended, and the result stands the test of time. Apart from the more specific ergonomic functions of task seating, the role of a chair hasn't really changed over thousands of years and the human body hasn't changed much and yet we see chairs develop in terms of their form tremendously and in reflection of, of the culture they come from, the technologies, the materials. So it's actually quite a, a rich ground to explore as a designer and one that I never seem to tire of. The Tom Chair is a remarkable achievement resulting from the advanced design and manufacturing undertakings of Tom Deacon and Kielhauer. The Tom Chair continues to enjoy international success, as do other products born out of this partnership. In fact, Deacon's subsequent task chair for Kielhauer decorates the Situation Room at the White House. The 1990s saw numerous striking and sophisticated designs come out of Canada, many as the result of extensive development processes. Canadian design truly reached new heights during this decade.